Well, the, for the first time ever in the hotel where we're staying, the Catholic Bible. I've never seen this before. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It's like, wait, this can't be right. Yeah, here it is. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church at Rome, right at the very beginning, says this. Ever since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes of eternal power and divinity have been, been able to be understood and perceived in what he has made. Another version of the same text. From the foundation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature can be clearly seen from the things that have been made. So according to Paul, according to the scripture, we're actually able to come to know something about God, even some of these invisible qualities, even something of his nature, from observing or perceiving certain things in the world that he's created. It's a very strong claim. In fact, uh, a lot of Christian traditions have, have sort of uh, shrunk from that conviction and try to explain away Paul's text in some way. But if you're Catholic, right at the beginning of the Catechism, in fact, paragraph 32, says this, the world starting from movement, becoming contingency, and the world's order and beauty, one can come to a knowledge of God as the origin and end of the universe. So from certain features of nature, of the natural world, we can come to knowledge of God, at least knowledge of God as the uh, originator and sort of creator and end of the universe. That doesn't mean we're gonna learn everything. Certainly, I would love it Frankly, if we could prove all the claims of the Nicene Creed from the law of non-contradiction, that would just, I would love, that'd be great. I'm hoping that Ed Feaster may, may accomplish that if anyone in this room is going to do it. But we don't have that, right? We have no reason to, to expect that we're going to learn the truth of the Trinity or of the doctrine of the Incarnation from looking at the world. This is God's general revelation. So we shouldn't expect that. Those are truths that God revealed to us in history and in the person of Jesus Christ. But we can, as Catholics, expect that there's certain things that we're going, we can learn from the natural world, and in fact, even learn things about God. Now, I'm not going to argue anything quite that strong this morning, though I think that that claim, I think it's related to that claim. But I do want to address very briefly the, the question of the conference. And so I'm going to do something, it's like three things you're not supposed to do in a talk. So I'm going to, I'm going to mix subjects shamelessly. I'm going to talk a little bit about science, a little about history, and a little about philosophy, all somewhat superficially, okay? So I'm going to confess that beginning, but there are a couple of things I want to accomplish. The first is to sort of to answer this question. I hope introduce some, uh, some distinctions that I think are really important in this discussion, and then give what I think are three very telling examples, what I would call signs of design, but you know, it could, you could call it other things, telltale signs of purpose, things that in the world that point beyond the world, whatever you want to call them, that come from natural science. All right, and so given what Paul says, given what the Catechism says, how should we answer this question? Can science inform our understanding of God? Well, as you suspected, what I'm going to want to do is distinguish certain things before I answer the question. There's four very different things I think we want to keep in mind, and as, as those of you that were here last night saw that, that if we don't define our terms carefully and we don't stick with those terms the way we've defined them, there's all sorts of mischief that we can do. And in fact, a lot of the debate, I think that a lot of the debate between uh, Dr. Behe and Dr. Barr last night, my sense was that they, were, they both agreed that, of course, something could appear purposeless or could appear unguided, but still be guided and intended by God. That's clearly logically possible. God could cover his tracks, just like any of us could. Um, but if you don't sort of state that clearly and precisely, it can, it can be quite frustrating. And so we've asked the question in this conference, can science inform our understanding of God? Well, what's science? Well, it turns out that that's almost an impossible question to answer. Uh, <laughs> And, and this is sort of a problem, of course. As mentioned last night, this is, a, this is a, an ancient word. I mean, it's, it comes from scientia, meaning basically knowledge, maybe wisdom. Uh, and the way this word was understood traditionally was it's just a, you know, a science is, a, is an area of study in which you have specific area th objects or subjects that you're, you're studying. Uh, you're looking for causes and explanations of that thing, and you're trying to do it systematically. And so theology was a science. 
Philosophy was a science, metaphysics was a science, or you know, you talk about natural philosophy, but science per se, that word was not reserved to the way it's reserved now. So when most people say science these days, most of us in this conference, we're talking about natural science. Well, why'd that happen? It's a long story, but it, 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 interestingly though, the word science was not restricted to natural science, as far as I can tell, until about the mid-19th century, and it was a result of, of accomplishment by a guy named William Huell. Um, and Huell, it's funny, he, he thought astronomy was the paradigmatic kind of intellectual discipline, and the, the sort of best example we have of knowledge in science. And so he actually reversed the traditional formula and called astronomy the queen of the sciences. You know, it was the you sort of, you know, number one. Um, it's a weird kind of thing, and he thought, okay, well, that's fine, but when he did this, what he did is he, he restricted the word science, knowledge, to the natural sciences. And by doing that, he subtly downgraded all the other sources of knowledge. So that now, in, in these kinds of discussions, you end up having to say, okay, look, I think that I have sort of rationally justifiable reasons for believing things. Um, is it scientific? Is it not? It gets very, very frustrating, but it's important to realize that that's happened. That there's a kind of rhetorical baggage. And so we don't want to make several mistakes. And first, we should just realize that's happened. And so, whatever science is, let's, I'm just going to restrict this to natural science today. It's, it refers to something like the institutions of natural science, maybe something like the methods, though they're, they're actually quite diverse. Um, it's sometimes, like if you read Newsweek or the New York Times, you'll get these constructions. Science says X, right? And it's so strange, really, right? Grammatically, science doesn't say anything. Scientists say things. Science writers say things. Science is an institution or a method or something like that. And that's different from scientism. What scientism, that's just the technical term for what I talked about a minute ago, which essentially treats science, natural science is currently understood, as either the, the, the most preeminent or the only source of public knowledge. Well, you realize what that then does, right, is that it treats everything else, even if it's some kind of knowledge, it's private knowledge, it's subjective or it's parochial. Right, and, you've, and we've all had these tests when we were in the fifth grade. My, you know, my children, I, I freed them from it because I saw it coming, but you, know, you, you go through a list and you've got fact, opinion, fact, opinion, fact, opinion. Remember these, right? And so um, you see some scientific claim, hydrogen's the lightest element or something, that, that's fact, right? The earth uh, revolves around the sun, that's fact. Ice, the best ice cream is vanilla, that's, what is that? It's supposed to be opinion, right? Uh, now, what, what about this? It's wrong always and everywhere to torture a small child for the fun of it. <laughs> that's a fact, obviously. In fact, that's a fact we all know better than any truth of science or history, of, of, of physics or history. And yet, on this kind of current rendering, it ends up being opinion, some kind of subjective thing. And so we, we don't want to commit this idea of scientism in which we, so we want to argue that, well, this argument is based on science because if it's not based on science, it's not actually a legitimate argument. We want to avoid that entirely. I think science provides very important, and in many cases very rigorous uh, and persuasive uh, forms of knowledge, but it's certainly not the only form. The next thing we want to distinguish is materialism. Now, everyone, at least I think, officially distinguishes philosophical materialism from science. You know, Carl Sagan maybe articulated this the best in his, his film, Cosmos. He said, the cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. I love that because, you know, you, everybody hears it, every Christian that hears it thinks, that sounds somewhat familiar, you know. Um, well, he meant that, of course. I mean, he's attributing the things that we would attribute to the creator to the created world. That's materialism or naturalism or something in its most robust sense. But there's also this other thing that's often now called methodological naturalism, right, which isn't so much a, a specifically a claim about what there is, but it's a claim about what science must be, what it is, what it has to be. And the claim is essentially this, is that when we're doing natural science, we can only appeal to impersonal mechanisms or to laws or to things within the universe. And if we appeal to something that's not finally kind of reducible to that, uh, then we're not doing science. We might be doing something else, and it's usually sort of shunted off into philosophy or metaphysics, which, you know, what that unfortunately often means to people is that, yeah, you know, that's what you talk about, and that's what you argue about at the dinner table, right? Um, that, that's the sort of dilemma we have. But, in fact, I think that's a mistake. I don't think we should confuse methodological naturalism 
and the discipline or the practice or community of natural science. In fact, I think it's a deeply mistaken view, uh, both descriptively uh, and philosophically. I know there's going to be some speakers. Uh, I suspect Professor Plantinga will talk about that this evening, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. But I still say, let's distinguish science from methodological naturalism. And finally, we want to dis uh, distinguish science, scientific theories, the community of science, natural scientists from the evidence of science. Now, you might think, okay, this guy's obviously a very naive kind of realist to say there's a distinction, but I think there is. I think there's a difference between, say, the Dar you know, Darwin's key claim, uh, the, the primary sort of source of the adaptive complexity you see in the biological world is the result of natural selection acting on random variations in the modern form, natural selection acting on random genetic mutations. That's a theoretical claim. There's a distinction between that claim and the evidence that we actually have for the creative power of that process, right? And I think if you keep the distinction clear in your mind, uh, you can do a lot of interesting work. I think you also discover that, in fact, we have very few examples of the creative power uh, of that process. But in any case, I think it's actually much more helpful to distinguish these things, the evidence of science from the practice of science and from the assumptions of science, than to make distinctions like, well, there's, let's distinguish evolution from evolutionism, which is a very common one. That's somewhat helpful, but I don't think it's quite as precise uh, as it ought to be. So what I'm uh, going to, I hope, talk about is some interesting evidence of science, things about nature that have been uncovered or discovered by natural scientists. And I would maintain that whatever we say about can science inform our understanding of God, I do think that the evidence of science, uh, especially some key pieces of evidence of science, have positive theological implications, uh, certainly contradict the leading uh, uh, component of, of, of Christianity or theism, namely materialism, and in fact provide, I think, some positive reason for believing in God, though I'd never say it sort of proves God's existence. So what's science? Fortunately, I, I told you it's very, very hard to, to uh, come up with a list of necessary and sufficient conditions for what natural science is. Uh, I was delighted to see that, you know, whoever wrote this entry at the Oxford English Dictionary actually managed to avoid almost all the philosophical problems. And so here's one of the main uh, definitions. This is the one I'll use. Science, or at least it's natural science, is the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. Not always experiment, not always repeatable experiment. Right? Observational astronomers can't do the same kinds of things that a, a chemist in his or her lab can do, but they're based on observations of the natural world, they're systematic, it's based on behavior and sort of properties of nature. And I would say, open to refutation on this, but I, I feel comfortable saying these are at least some abiding features of natural science. These are some of the key intellectual virtues of natural science. It's based on public evidence from nature, so not private revelations, not say, religious text uh, uh, that uh, the authority of which is disputed, but public evidence that in principle everyone or s people studying the subject have access to. Mike Behe's argument's a good example. He talks about things like the blood clotting cascade or the bacterial flagellum. He doesn't appeal to Genesis 1, right, or to, uh, you know, to a private uh, metaphysical or religious experience that he's had. He might have that, and it might actually justify his belief, but it's not a piece of public evidence. The theories in science make a difference in some way empirically. That is, they can be confirmed or somehow tested. Not necessarily falsified, but tested. Uh, the philosopher at Calvin College, Del Ratch, puts it just perfectly. He said, we want our theories in science to be put in empirical harm's way. We want them to, to have something to say about what we actually would discover if we're looking at the world. They, we want them to be systematic. They're not just sort of haphazard kind of interesting observations like a you know, like a comedy routine by Jerry Seinfeld, right? Interesting, random, unconnected uh, observations. We want them to be systematic. We want them to use standard methods of reasoning, whatever those are, not, you know, obscure or esoteric uh, ways of coming uh, to knowledge. And I would say the key intellectual virtue of natural science, properly practiced, is an openness to nature. So that the scientist, the natural scientist, he or she wants to dispose himself or herself to the natural world in such a way that whatever it's like, whatever it manifests, at least empirically, uh, that scientist will adjust his or her views of nature accordingly. So it's an openness. So you don't decide everything beforehand what nature has to be like, that nature has to be a certain way, that 
you know, orbits around planets have to be a certain way or that certain objects of different weights have to fall a certain way. You go and look. And, and, and you want what you think about the world in part to be tempered by that. And so I think that's actually the, the, the key and most important and, and most noble intellectual virtue of science. And notice none of those have anything to do with sort of methodological naturalism or coming up with the best material explanation of nature. So the question is, whence came the idea that natural science just is or requires methodological naturalism? Where'd that come from? Unfortunately, it's a complicated story. Let me give this to you very, very briefly. And I, you know, I sort of tremble at trying to do this because I, I know whenever you, people see the, like the Aristotle's four causes, I know brains shut off. I know they do. You all learned it somewhere. And you say, I understood it for five minutes. I've forgotten the, the distinctions. And I did the same thing for a long time. But I think these are very, very important for understanding our current dilemma and actually finally for getting out of it. Of course, the Greek philosopher Aristotle has these, these categories of four causes, which to modern ears is very counterintuitive. Uh, and it's because we have restricted what we mean by cause. But what Aristotle basically means is these are the positive factors that determine or explain what something is or fully explain something. The material cause basically explains what something is made of. All right? It's more complicated than this, but this is, a, this is a way to get a handle on it. The efficient cause explains where something came from, what's like the external thing that brought it about. Right? Who is, who or what uh, distinct thing produced or moved it? The formal cause essentially explains what something is. Um, is this a cat? Uh, is this hydrogen? Things like that. And the final cause explains the ultimate purpose toward which things in nature tend. Um, uh, this is actually it's an extremely helpful kind of set of mental categories to have to think about things because then you realize actually for almost everything, these are questions, you know, why, what's something for? Why is it here? What is it? What's caused it to come into existence? What's it made of? Those are really important questions. And in fact, people often say, well, science just asks the how questions, and metaphysics or philosophy asks the why questions. The problem is, is that scientists ask why questions all the time. But they do it kind of uh, unaware very often of, uh, of these, these crucial distinctions. Now, what's interesting is that in, in the Christian tradition, and also in the Neoplatonic tradition, these causes were expanded. and so. The causes are normally treated kind of more loosely or broadly in, in the Christian tradition, and uh, it's really important to distinguish that. And this is important especially for our discussion, okay? So you're, you're saying now he's already given us those distinctions, he's going to give us more. Yes, okay, but, so just stick with me. I promise this is just the very high, sort of high summit in terms of uh, uh, pedantry that you'll have this morning, all right? Um, there was an intense debate in the Middle Ages when the Christian West was introduced to you know, the large sort of corpus of Aristotle's writings as to how much Aristotle's ideas were compatible with the Christian faith and the Christian tradition. And it's a long, very interesting debate. And people came out on different sides, but it's eventually decided that in fact properly interpreted, properly chastised and baptized, Aristotle was in fact very useful for theology as long as we remember just a few certain things. One, of course, is that Aristotle believed in the sort of in the eternality of the world, that it just, just does exist, right? Now, Thomas Aquinas taught us that the world could be eternal and still created because it's contingent, right? But the faith, the Christian faith, has always said that, in fact, it's not eternal. At least as a truth of faith, uh, it hasn't always existed. And so um, a lot of folks, St. Bonaventure and others, were very concerned about that particular Aristotelian claim. The other claim that Bonaventure in particular was concerned about uh, was a specific kind of Aristotelian tendency not to recognize what he called sort of exemplar causes or ideas or paradigmatic causes in the mind of God. This is was very common in the Christian tradition. You can see this uh, in Augustine. Uh, and Bonaventure was intent on making sure that that was preserved. But what's interesting is that this is something that's a kind of common inheritance. I know I'm at Franciscan University, so that's why I've got a picture of Thomas and Bonaventure here, but this is, I know how these arguments go. Um, there's Thomas and anti Thomas, and lots of Thomas argue amongst themselves. And this, you know, <laughs> it can get really kind of ugly, but this is a point on which there's broad agreement, okay? Um, and so it's, in fact, in, it's quite helpful, I think, to read Bonaventure and St. Thomas alongside each other on this particular point. So, how do we expand the causes? Well, here's the issue. Remember, I told you what the efficient, the formal, the final and the material cause are. The popular way of illustrating this is you've got a sculptor, and he's sculpting a, scu uh, a statue from a, from a lump of uh, marble. Now, this is 
a partial analogy, obviously, because we're dealing with a human here rather than God, all right? But in this case, the sculptor is the efficient cause. Uh, the sort of shape or what the thing is is the formal cause. It's a statue. The material cause, obviously, the marble. And the final cause is what? It's like, well, what's it for? It's to be displayed or it's to be a statue of Apollo or Zeus or something like that in the Pantheon. That's what, that's what it's for. It's what it, it, it's intended for, all right? Now, this picture already kind of gives it away here, but it, when you say that, it sounds like, okay, where do these things come from, right? Is that just the full explanation of something? Of course, in a, in a theistic understanding, the question is, where do these things come from? Um, obviously, they come from God, ultimately, in his causality. Uh, but the importance of this idea of exemplar cause is that we trace the forms, these formal causes that are in things, ultimately back to these ideas in the mind of God. And so to distinguish that, sometimes those are both called formal cause. So the form that's in the thing is the form, and the idea in the mind of God is the, the formal cause. That's really confusing, though, I think. So I think uh, what we want to do is sort of distinguish these. And so the best way to think of it is that the form that's in the thing, right, that's a formal cause, and it's a cause properly understood, but that that ultimately reflects this idea of the thing in the mind of God. And God, of course, has knowledge of particular people. He knew you in your mother's womb as he formed you, but he also knows these truths of certain universal forms, and those are reflected in the mind of God. And Thomas held this, St. Augustine held this, St. Bonaventure held this, and it's really important because what that means is that things that we see have, have both a intrinsic and sort of empirically manifest principle of intelligibility that we can study, and then they also uh, have their source ultimately in the mind of God, which is not obviously a material object. So we have both those things. So it's not, you don't, you can look at a formal cause and study it, right, without deciding a particular theological question, and yet it also ultimately kind of points to back to those things. So those are very important um, uh, distinctions. And the instrumental cause is just like those other things that went in that the efficient cause used to create something. All right? So you have that. I know you're all going to remember this from now on, right? So you got the formal, the efficient, the material, the final, and the exemplar cause, which is in some ways it's like a, it's like a formal cause. It's just that it's in the mind of God. All right? Well, what's interesting, that, so that's the kind of intellectual background, um, and a lot of natural science came from that background. It's a, it's a myth that sort of all of natural science sort of sprung into existence in the early modern period or during the Enlightenment or something. In fact, almost every interesting uh, insight you can find somewhere, at least in, in uh, seminal form, in these, this period. What happened, um, and this is a long, complicated story, is that at some point, um, many people came to think that this kind of scholastic understanding had gotten decadent, that certain ways of explaining things were not all that useful. It's like, why does this rock fall to the ground? Well, it's the final cause of the rock is, you know, to move toward the earth or something like that. And it, so that doesn't seem to explain all that much. And so um, two people, uh, Francis Bacon and, and Rene Descartes, actually said, basically, let's divide reality. This is, this is my words, but they said, let's, let's kind of uh, partition off these things, and let's banish formal and final causes from our explanation of nature. They didn't say from science exactly, but that's basically what they're after. Now, Descartes actually denied the existence of formal and final causes. Don't, they don't, essentially don't exist. But Bacon said, yeah, they exist, but like, we're not going to deal with them here. Uh, maybe, you know, metaphysicians will deal with them or something like that. Now, even if you read the Catholic Encyclopedia from, you know, the 1911 article on cause that discusses these things, even that article says, okay, there was a certain kind of scholastic decadence that needed to be challenged and critiqued. And what we've discovered, of course, in, in modern science, all sorts of things in the natural world that no one knew anything about, all sorts of ways of explaining things uh, with mathematical formalisms that no one knew anything about. That's all wonderful. Um, maybe it's true that, that this needed to happen in order for those things to be discovered. I'm a little skeptical. I don't think it had to happen. But in any case, it clearly led to an extreme overreaction because it essentially cut off two very important things that we need really ultimately to explain things. And so you wouldn't be surprised to learn that in the practice of natural science, these causes under other names kind of kept reappearing um, if illicitly. And so when you read Isaac Newton, who is, it, is in, sense, in a sense kind of an anti-Aristotelian, Nevertheless, he was very critical of the Cartesians, 
and did not want to sort of collapse into a purely kind of mechanistic or materialistic explanation of the world. And so though he's credited with the laws of motion and extending the mathematical explanation of the world farther perhaps than anyone else prior to him, nevertheless, here's what he says in his Principia in the General Scolium. He's talking about the, the solar system. He says, though, though these bodies may indeed continue in their orbits by the mere laws of gravity, yet they could by no means have at first derived the regular position of their orbits themselves from those laws. Thus, the most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Unlike Darwin, who, when he wrote The Origin of Species, did, in a sense, if you read the argument, see himself as getting God out of the life business. I mean, he's lots of arguments. Here's this thing. God wouldn't have done it that way. It must have been the result of this process I'm talking about. There's nothing like that in the Principia. In fact, Newton thought he was securing the sort of place of this, he was creating a kind of mechanistic explanation, and the source for that mechanism would have to clearly be uh, a transcendent God. That's at least how he understood it. Now, it didn't work out all that well, but notice what he's doing. Even in anti-Aristotelian context, he's appealing to purposes and design and things like that. And then William Paley in The Watchmaker, as Mike Behe mentioned briefly, uh, widely read in the English-speaking world, he describes this watch resting on a heath. And here he does something interesting. Paley does talk about evidence of design in the cosmos, but he focuses largely on the intricate configuration of the parts of organisms that seem to work together for a purpose, much like a watch. So you see a watch with different interacting parts, and he thinks that that should lead you to conclude that there's a, there's a benevolent God, or certainly a God. Um, so pa Paley did focus on order, but he also focused on what we might now call complexity, some sort of purposive complexity. Okay, that's all background. So, so what did Darwin do in this context? We did several things, obviously. He proposed something, first of all, the, the explanation for the complexity of life, the adaptive complexity of life, that was much better than mere chance. Prior to Darwin, in many cases, people said, well, look, you look at organisms, you look at the eye, you look at the heart, the arm, you, either this was designed or it just happened, right? And if those are the two choices, uh, design is, is really obvious. What Darwin wanted to do, at the very least, is propose a, a purely uh, mechanistic or material mechanism that would explain the apparent design in the biological world, but explain it as mere apparent design, so not real. So on the one hand, he says, of course things like Richard Dawkins said, they look designed, they have a kind of purposiveness, they look like they're directed toward ends, but in fact they're the result of this purely impersonal process of natural selection and random variation. Darwin also did something else, though, is that he helped establish, in fact, I think it's Neil Gillespie, the historian of science, that says in some, in some ways is the more important accomplishment of Darwin is that he helped kind of secure this idea that for something to be natural science, it could only appeal to natural or material causes. So he sort of secured this thing, even though there had been supposedly the banishment of, of formal and final causes from science, even though there had been these partial rebellions from people uh, like Newton and Paley in a non-Aristotelian context, Darwin seems finally to have secured that. All right, so that's, that's sort of background. Um, and I think that's why we are where we are. So then the question is, I'm going to talk about three pieces of evidence that I would call evidences of intelligent design. And I know as well as anyone that's involved in this that that word has certain connotations. And my view is that people, any sort of theory or any sort of idea, the person who is advocating it has privilege access to define it. Darwin has privilege access to say, what do you mean by your theory? And so Mike Behe has privilege access to what he means and doesn't mean. And so what I, I think I, what I say here is something that every person that is a public proponent of intelligent design would agree to, or if they haven't sort of said things this way, they would agree to it on reflection. So what is intelligent design? Well, it argues that at least some features of nature are best explained as the result of intelligent agency. That doesn't mean that only those things can be explained that way. It doesn't mean that those are the only things that are a result of purpose or design. It's just that at least some are ultimately best explained in terms of agency rather than a mechanism. ID is a search for telltale patterns in nature. What are the conditions that we observe? When is it that we infer design or perceive design? We don't always do it. Why is it that most clouds don't look like anything in particular? Sometimes clouds look a little like Mickey Mouse, but we know, eh, yeah, it's just kind of, a, it's fake, it's not real, but we know immediately when we see Mount Rushmore, even if we don't know the origin, that it's the result of an intelligent agent. 
How do you know? What are the conditions? What are the properties that when they're there, we sort of reliably say that's the result of, of intelligent causation? So it's a search. That's a kind of a philosophical thing. ID draws on public evidence of nature in principle and uses standard modes of reasoning and tries to be metaphysically minimal, at least in the public arguments. And then I would argue that if understood properly, ID is in a sense a revival, very much in fits and starts, of a, a revival of formal or exemplar and final causation in science, but hopefully in a more rigorous form. The, the earlier accusation was that these causes were fruitless in science. They didn't do any real explaining. In fact, they prevented certain kinds of explanations. And so what you have, you'll notice in ID, not just arguments for, from folks, but also lots of conceptual distinctions and, and, and categories and ideas. For instance, frequently in the tradition, the debate has sort of been between, you know, we talk about order and we talk about chaos. But order is a kind of rough-hewn category. There's the order of a snowflake or the order of a, you know, the law of gravity or, or something like that. And that's different from the order that's in a written text or that is in the sequences of the coding regions of DNA or the three-dimensional structure of a protein or the body plan of an animal. That's a different kind of order. Um, and, and so we want a category. And so a lot of ID folks will talk about things like irreducible complexity, which Mike Behe argues is a kind of telltale sign of intelligence. Specified complexity is a, a more general category that when you find something that's both complex or improbable, but also conforms to an independent and meaningful pattern, you can reliably infer intelligence. So Mount Rushmore, it's not just that it's improbable, any pile of rocks is improbable, it conforms very tightly to this pattern of four American presidents, so we infer design. Those are new categories. Uh, most ID arguments draw on a specific and very rich understanding of the idea of information. Information. Form is in that word, and I don't think it's a coincidence. I think uh, in the talk of information in natural science, both physics and biology, I think at least points at or par partially captures much of the intuition of the traditional idea of formal cause. It doesn't mean that every ID theorist, every biologist is going to talk in this way, but I think if you can think of the, these arguments in that way, the kind of isolated attempts, then you'll, you'll kind of uh, understand what's happening. So that's, that's the background. So let's give three, what I would call signs of design from uh, physics and astronomy, from the material sciences. Think of these as those physical necessary conditions for the existence of chemically based life. I don't think any of these are anywhere nearly sufficient conditions for the origin of life, but they're necessary. All right, and what's funny is, I don't know why this is, but it's slightly less controversial to talk about design in the physical sciences than in biology. I, I, I call it the Sco Scopes monkey trial problem, you know. <laughs> There's all the baggage when it comes to biology. Most of you may know these stories. I'll mention them just very briefly. But first, it's of course this, this discovery that the universe has an age, that it's finite in the past. Uh, the general consensus of scientists in the 19th century was that the universe was eternal. In fact, that presupposing the existence of the universe was a fundamental assumption of all science. There were scientists in the 30s and 40s that said that even the question of whether the universe had a beginning, where it came from, that you can't even discuss that in science. And yet, of course, Edwin Hubble began uh, in an interesting set of discoveries when he was studying these so-called nebula. Uh, we now call them galaxies. He was able to measure the distances to these, and as he measured more and more of them, he noticed a pattern of a red shifting of these clusters of galaxies. Um, and the red shifting, that is the shifting of the light toward the red part of the spectrum, implied the universe was expanding in every direction. Uh, and it, this is actually even a sort of a relation called the, the, the relation between the redshift and the distance for extragalactic nebulae. And it's basically this. The farther away something, a galaxy is, the faster or the redder its light is. That's a huge implication. It takes the mind about five seconds to work it out. As it turns out, Einstein's general theory of relativity had actually predicted in its original form that the universe should be expanding or contracting. Einstein didn't like it, added a variable to prevent the problem repented of it, in part uh, based on the evidence of Hubble and others. But think about it for five seconds. The universe is expanding. Everything in, the matter, space, time, and energy is in a state of expansion in every, in, in every single place. R reverse the tape of cosmic time, and there's going to be a point in the finite past. Right? In fact, with a, a few more uh, uh, rigorous discoveries and analyses, uh, the, a widespread assumption came that there would be a point in the finite past in which the universe would coalesce 
into a point of infinite volume or infinite density and zero volume. Now, that doesn't prove the doctrine of creation, obviously, ex nihilo, but it's really a lot of trouble if you're a materialist. God could create an eternal universe. So, you know, that's, it's an interesting question. But it's very hard to be a materialist if the material universe began to exist. That's, that tells you that the material universe, if anything, is at least a crummy candidate for ultimate explanation. And it gives force to this, this, uh, this type of a, the cosmological argument uh, that before, I think, was almost purely speculative. It basically goes like this. Anything that begins to exist must have a cause for its existence. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe must have a cause for its existence. And you can work that out. It's got to be something other than the universe. It's got to have the capacities to build our uni universe into existence. If you deny that, you end up saying very weird things like Stephen Hawking said last year. He said, because a Lucasian professor of mathematics at, at Cambridge, which was Newton's chair, said in the press and repeated, uh, because of a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself spontaneously from nothing. That's what you're left with, right? If you're going to be a materialist, you're left with something like that. To which I, that seems to me to be a reductio ad absurdum of, of the materialist case. But that's, that's a huge thing. And this was the discovery uh, of scientists that weren't looking for it and, in fact, generally didn't like the idea. Here's how Robert Dickey at Princeton, who was important in the, uh, the sort of analysis of the cosmic background radiation. He said, an infinitely old universe would relieve us of the necessity of understanding the origin of matter at any finite time in the past. Relieving is not a technical scientific term, <laughs> right? <laughs> the verb betrays him here. Now, again, the universe, if it were eternal, could still, of course, be contingent and so created by God. But if it has a beginning, it's really troubling to the materialist. It doesn't provide the kind of relief that would be preferred. Now, you might say, okay, that's a cosmological argument. Not a, it doesn't really have to do with the teleological or design argument. But the interesting thing is that because the universe had a beginning, we can now talk about things like initial conditions and, and physical constants. Here's Martin Rees. He said, the possibility of life as we know it depends on the values of a few basic physical constants and is, in some respects, remarkably sensitive to their numerical values. Nature does exhibit remarkable coincidences. Now here he's talking about constants. These are just these, these things that are true kind of everywhere in the universe. Popular ones, we think about forces, you know, sort of as laymen, uh, uh, the fundamental forces of, of gravity and electromagnetism and the strong and weak nuclear force, which have particular values and particular size scales and things like that. And Reese is saying those have to be very precisely tuned, uh, remarkable coincidences. There's also this question of initial conditions. What was the universe like? What did it need to be like at the beginning in order to be anything like what it is now? This is Paul Davies. Again, these, are, these guys, neither of these guys are theists. So the present arrangement of matter indicates a very special choice of initial conditions. And in fact, the choice is, is mind-boggling if you're sort of interested in big numbers. And the basic idea is that the universe looks like it's very precisely fine-tuned for the existence of complex life. There's all sorts of ways that a universe could be, and the more physicists have come to understand these things, the more they've been able to realize this and to say, okay, what would the universe be like? You imagine it as a universe creating machine, and it's got all the dials on it that specify the various constants and the values of these things in the universe, and then what happens if you change one of those? The idea of fine tuning is that if you fiddle with one of the dials, even if you leave one of the others, all the others the same, you end up with an uninhabitable universe, uninhabitable by any kind of plausible chemically based life. That's fi the cosmic fine tuning, the stuff that's true everywhere. But what's interesting is that it, even in a universe that's habitable, that's finely tuned at the cosmic level, you still got to get a whole lot of stuff right at the local level in order to have a so called habitable planet. That is a, a planet a location where life can persist and exist. Now I'm gonna give you a really quick thumbnail sketch because this is the argument that Guillermo Gonzalez and I make in The Privileged Planet. And I'll tell you when we get to the controversial stuff, all right? This is not the controversial stuff, is that in this universe with this periodic table of the elements, there's nothing like carbon for building large information rich, you know, micromolecules, macromolecules, all the kind of things that chemically based life needs. In fact, there's no other atom that comes close to uh, carbon and its ability to form large so-called metastable or metastable molecules and to bond with so many other elements. In other words, 
it, it's stable enough that you can build complex structures, you can use it to code for information, but it's not so stable that it can't also sort of interact chemically. And as it happens, water is liquid over the same narrow range of temperatures over which carbon chemistry is most reactive. So carbon and water are these un really uniquely fit things for building uh, any form of chemically based life. Our argument's completely based on that. If we find a fundamentally different type of life around an X-ray belching star in a totally different system, we're going to have problems with our argument. But I just tell you that it's an assumption, but it's also widely held uh, and not all that widely disputed for very good reasons based on chemistry. Well, what that means automatically is that just based on the rules of chemistry, there are going to be very few locations in the universe where you're going to have life. Uh, of any sort, and it turns out the more we've learned, the more we realize that in fact you need a very long and growing list of ingredients of things to build a habitable planet. Here's just a few of the things. You need the right kind of terrestrial planet, a rocky planet that's the right size, so it has the right kind of gravity, the right kind of geological activity uh, in, in its core. You need a large stabilizing moon, like our moon, it stabilizes the Earth uh, on its tilt of its axis. You need plate tectonics. Interestingly, it, that's not a happy story because I live in Seattle, and so we sort of deal with the bad side of that, but you, it turns out you need it, ultimately. You need the right kind of atmosphere, at least for large uh, life like ourselves, probably nitrogen, oxygen rich. You need the right kind of planetary neighbors. It turns out that you know, the other planets almost certainly don't have life on them, but these large planets like Jupiter and Saturn are very important for protecting the inner part of the solar system from the visitation from these comets in the outer part of the solar system. You can think of them, they sort of take a lot of hits for us. Comets, is, they're like your crazy ant. You don't want her visiting your neighborhood very often. You know, you show up, exterminate life and things like that. So you know, it's weird because you know, the astrologers thought these planets played a role in our existence. It turns out they do in a different way. You need the right kind of single star. Almost certainly, most stars in our galaxy are not these single stars like the sun. You need the right kind of star, probably one very much like our own. You need to be in the right kind of galaxy, probably a large, heavy element rich galaxy like the uh, Milky Way. You need to be in the right location, there's a certain neighborhood in the galaxy. Uh, you need to be at the right cosmic time, and you need to be, as I said, in that a universe fine-tuned for life. And you need to be there's a lot of other stuff. You need to be in the right place around your star, in the so-called Goldilocks zone, right? So it's not too hot and not too cold for maintaining liquid water. So you get a lot of this stuff, and when people hear this, they initially and intuitively say, wow, this is like Paley's watch, you know? All these things had to come together to make life possible. Isn't that another good piece of evidence for design? And I, I think yes, but the problem is the skeptic can say, okay, maybe the fine-tuning, the cosmic level is, makes sense, but the universe is a huge place. You know, there's probably maybe 10 to the 22 stars in the observable universe. Huge opportunities. So it could be the universe is just this grand cosmic lottery. And yeah, it's highly improbable you're going to get all these things together. But given a big, big enough universe, maybe it happens, you know, just purely kind of by, by what we would call uh, random processes. Now, even if that's true, of course, it's possible that God uh, intended it. So it's, not, it's only apparently random and not really random or purposeless, as I would put it. The question is, still, is there any positive evidence for design here? That is, is there something in addition to this that suggests coincidence rather than conspiracy? And we think there is. I think if you look at the, the details of the evidence uh, here, what you discover is that those conditions for habitability correlate with the conditions for measurability or discovery. Now, Guillermo, my co-author of The Privileged Planet, sitting here in the front row, I'm going to tell you that was his idea for the title of the book. Right there. <laughs> and I said, that, yeah, that's going to sell a lot. <laughs> so we, we ended up coming up, I think, with a better title. But here's, the, here's the basic idea. The same narrow range of circumstances that allow us to exist also provide us with the best overall setting for making a wide range of otherwise sort of competing scientific discoveries. Or to put it differently, the very conditions that make Earth hospitable to, to intelligent life also make it well suited to viewing and analyzing the universe as a whole. Just to cut to the chase, what we're saying is that the possibility of science is built into things, every bit as much as the fine tuning for life itself. So what we do in the book, it's very much a comparative argument. It's not at all a deductive argument. It's like the argument a, a, you know, a lawyer in a, a case in court would make, in which we come up with, we give a lot of examples of the things you need for a habitable planet, and then we say, okay, let's compare that to less habitable planets and see, do those things that make the Earth habitable to life also make it better suited 
to doing science on that planet than compared to, uh, to less habitable planets. And so we give a lot of examples in the book uh, that, and I'll just give two very quickly. I, I don't, this, as I said, it's a cumulative case argument, which means you can't make it persuasively in eight minutes. And so I'm going to just give you very briefly so you kind of get the idea. First is this example of, of total solar eclipses, which is actually where this, this argument started. Now, most of you get what an eclipse is, right? You, you, at least a, a solar eclipse is when you get the moon, you get the sun, you get the earth all lined up in space, and then the moon is the occulting or eclipsing object, and it passes in front of the sun, between the earth and the sun, and so if you're on the path of the eclipse, you'll see this. You'll see the moon cover uh, the sun. And what's interesting, though, is that this could happen in a lot of different ways, but as it happens on the earth, so the apparent size of the moon just barely covers the sun as seen from Earth. So that gives us not just mere eclipses of some very sort, but some, you might call perfect eclipses. There's this virtually perfect match between the shape and the size of these two radically different and radically differently sized objects in the sky. Now Guillermo did a study of this. He thought, huh, I wonder what kind of eclipses you get elsewhere in the solar system. So he did a, what I assume was a tedious study that's much more fun to report than to have done. Um, to say, what, what would the eclipses be like on the other less habitable planets? Well, it's spend a lot of time with this, and I don't even know if you can see it in the light, but this basically is a, is a result of, of Guillermo's analysis of the major moons. The take-home lesson is that it's only on Earth that you get these, these perfect eclipses in our solar system. There's one other place, a little potato-shaped moon, uh, Prometheus around Saturn, that whips around Saturn, and so in just the right moment for a couple of seconds you get what's close to it, but like I said, it's shaped like a potato, it's not, it's not round or spherical. So the, essentially the one place where there are solar eclipses in the solar system is precisely where observers are there to see them. Now that's weird. In fact, I, even, I got a, a, an atheist, the Colorado's leading atheist was the, the tagline, I had this debate after the book came out, I thought, that sounds like, you know, the best downhill skier from Fort Lauderdale or something. I mean, yeah, is that good, you know? But he admitted that, okay, if it's true that there's this correlation between life and discovery, it would be weird. It would be, you know, suggestive. Uh, and then he, re you know, went on to talking about how he went to church and stuff like that. But, um, and so there's something weird and fishy about it. But the question is, is there more to it than that? Well, what's interesting is that perfect eclipses are very important for scientific discovery. Now remember, to get perfect eclipses, what do you need? You need a couple of things. You need your planet to be a certain distance from its host star. And if your planet's habitable, it's gonna, that's going to fix the distance from that star, and so fix the size and appearance of that star in your sky. You also need a large, well-placed moon, right? On a habitable planet, that's going to fix the size and location of that moon in your sky. As it turns out, those two conditions needed for habitability provide perfect eclipses for those on its surface. All right, so two crucial conditions for habitability produce perfect eclipses, which themselves are very, very important in scientific discovery. I'll give you just a, a brief example. is this famous test of general relativity, which Einstein predicted essentially um, that, that uh, large, massive bodies, uh, gravity uh, wells or fields of these bodies would affect light specifically. So, you know, a specific prediction he had is that if you could sort of analyze and determine where a set of stars were in the sky at one point, come back and then measure the location, of the apparent location of those stars when the sun is in the sky near them, right, the, the, the stars would appear to move from their locations. They didn't actually move, but what happened is that light was affected by the mass of the sun, and it needs to pass right near the edge of the sun. Now, what's the problem with that experiment in most circumstances? It don't, this is this kind of tell your kids, don't try this at home, right? You don't try to look for stars right near the edge of the sun under normal circumstances. But one time you'd want to do that is when you get perfect eclipses. And they need to be nearly perfect. Um, you know, if they're just slightly smaller eclipses, in fact, the sky is too bright. If they're much, the moon were much larger, it would probably block the very stars that are affected by this effect. And this effect was first detected in 1919, kind of imprecisely, and then confirmed. Uh, it, in subsequent eclipses. So it's a very important discovery. It's, and it's just one thing, one example of what eclipses have given us. Let me give you one more example of this. I mentioned briefly a couple of minutes ago that there's a, a neighborhood, a location within particular galaxies in which uh, a planet probably needs to be if it's going to be habitable for very long. 
And in fact, you're not, you, first you need to be in the right kind of galaxy that has the right kind of elements, things heavier than, than helium. Astronomers call all the elements heavier than hydrogen and helium metals, which I assume you do that so you don't have to remember all the others. You know? So you've got these light elements, hydrogen and helium, and the metals. And you need metals to build planets and cells and bodies and things like that. So you need a large galaxy for various reasons to do that. And there's this sort of gradient in spiral galaxies like our own in which you get more heavy elements clo the closer you get to the center of the galaxy. So you need to be close enough to it to have those heavy elements available, but not so close uh, that you end up, you know, sort of dealing with very dangerous things. So the habitable planet needs heavy elements, but to survive complex life, you don't want to be, you want to be close, but not too close. Uh, there's probably a, a giant black hole. There's certainly very dense sort of stars and supernovae going off in the center of the galaxy. You don't want to be really close in the neighborhood. In fact, you probably even want to be between the spiral arms of the galaxy. Basically, the galactic habitable zone is about midway out from the center to the edge of the galaxy between spiral arms and rotating around the galaxy in more or less the same pace as the other stuff. And so here's, here's where we are, uh, registered by a satellite that we sent up out of the galaxy a couple of years ago. Um, not really, if you know the size scales on these things. Uh, it took us a long time actually to figure this out. But we're about midway out from the center to the edge of the galaxy between the Sagittarius and Perseus arms. You won't be surprised if I told you, okay, this is what you need, then for us to discover that, oh, hey, we're in the galactic capital zone, right? That's not especially surprising because we wouldn't be here if we weren't there, right? But what's interesting is that that has implications. It means that there's going to be a lot of places if you're looking for life elsewhere, you just don't waste your time looking. Look in this zone. Here's the technical diagram of the, the idea. <laughs> All right, so you got the blow up of our solar system with the little circumstellar habitable zone, and you got the center, which is very dangerous. All right, I'm coming right to the end here. So then the question is this, that's great. But if you could be in only one place for scientific discovery, for figuring out there's a background radiation, distinguishing it from the galactic radiation, seeing other kinds of stars, figuring out the structure of our galaxy, all these kinds of things that, would, uh, the physical location, there would be competition for discovering these things. You can only pick one place to be. Where would you want to be? It's in the galactic habitable zone. All right, now that's, the question is, so what? Well, Guillermo and I argue that this actually, con it conforms to a pattern that suggests something like conspiracy rather than mere coincidence. And this is how I would, this is a very pedantic way of putting it, but you could sort of say that it's, at the very least, it's confirmation of a design hypothesis like this, is this correlation between life and discovery is more likely on the hypothesis that the universe is designed for discovery than on the chance hypothesis. That is the hypothesis that there was, there's no sort of purpose to th these things in the universe. You just would expect this. If you thought there's no purpose to the universe, you see this, and what are you going to say? It's just weird. In fact, Discover Magazine in 1999 gave Guillermo's paper on eclipses a weird science discovery of 1999, because it doesn't make sense. But if you think the universe is perhaps designed, it has a purpose, and one of those purposes is to be read, is to be uh, understood, you might actually think something like that's true, and you wouldn't be surprised. It would confirm what you believed. So we'd argue that a modest conclusion is that the universe is fine-tuned so that environments habitable to observers will provide the best overall conditions for observation and discovery, or that the universe looks like it's designed for discovery. Psalm 19 starts, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they display knowledge. What's interesting is that those heavens have displayed more knowledge at different times in history, and we live at a time in which we're privileged to discover that the universe is not only points beyond itself to God, to a purpose, because we believe that as a matter of faith, but that in fact, if we look at the evidence with open eyes, the natural world confirms that truth of the faith. Thank you very much. So in my, in my response, I wanted to talk about the general issue that has been one of the themes already of the conference is sort of like, what, what, do we, what are the issues around this notion of design? And I want to contrast the classical view of design and the modern view. And Jay's already talked about some of this, the Aristotelian view, the, um, the modern views. I'm going to highlight some of those things and draw out certain conclusions. And I, I actually 
want to try to explain in some ways some of the exact issues Jay ra raised. For example, he, he raised the question, he says, I don't know why it is that the uh, fine-tuning arguments, the arguments from physics and cosmology are more popular or it's less controversial than some of the arguments for design and biology. I'm going to try to actually explain that in my, in my brief presentation here because I think uh, it's actually pretty, um, pretty straightforward to understand why there's that difference. So let's start with the classical view. And the classical view is, is nicely encapsulated in the famous Fifth Way of St. Thomas, which I think is actually worth looking at uh, and reading. Um, the Fifth Way is taken from the governance of the world. I'm going to pause right there and say when St. Thomas talks about governance, he's not talking about a puppet master, someone who is dr directly causing, in, uh, without creaturely causes, the activities of the world, but rather providential reign, which involves both fully creaturely causes and providential cause of God's actions. So the governance of the world is the fifth way. We see the things which lack intelligence, such as natural bodies, act for an end, and this is evident from their acting always, or nearly always, in the same way, so as to obtain the best result. Hence it is plain that not fortuitously, but designedly, do they achieve their end. Now whatever lacks intelligence cannot move towards an end unless it be directed by someone being endowed with knowledge and intelligence. As, arrow, as the arrow is shot to, be, it, to its mark by the archer. Therefore, some intelligent being exists by whom all natural things are directed to their end, and this being we call God. So that's the fifth way. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. The essence of the, of the classical argument is that natural things always are, for the most part, as the formulation goes, will attain their ends unless they're thwarted by some other uh, intervening cause. Now, how can they do that? Why do they do that? That's kind of the crux of the question. How is it that things like bees can dance and communicate with one another, and yet they don't have any rational uh, capabilities, but they communicate through symbol systems? Or something as simple as a proton. Why does a proton always, or for the most part, act in a certain way? And the answer given by the classical conception of nature is they do that uh, because of the, this quasi-intelligent, I'll call it quasi-intelligent behavior, that is, things that lack intelligence behave intelligently. That's kind of the essence of the classical notion of, of design. And in short, we can summarize it as follows. The essence of the classical way is the quasi-intelligent behavior of unintelligent things. This is, by the way, a completely universal principle. Everything in nature that is intelligible, that is that we can understand, acts in an orderly fashion, and therefore, in the classical conception, acts for an end. The argument roughly runs like this. Order in nature, the finality, it comes from mind. Order only comes from mind. What we see when we look at nature is uh, order and finality. Um, I'm sorry. So w when we find things that are orderly then, and, and intelligible, uh, we know that those things are the result of mind. So everything in nature is the result of mind. That's kind of the core. It's a very, very maximalist position. So it, it, from the design perspective, this is design everywhere. That's, that's the classical view. Now, that doesn't mean that every single thing is orderly, and, and at least as we can see it. And there may be lots of contingencies, there may be chance events and so forth, but predominantly what you see when you look at the natural world is this orderliness. And therefore, in the classical conception of design, you can think of it as in terms of intrinsic final cause. That is, within each creaturely thing, within each substance or within each kind of existing thing, that thing has a natural tendency towards an end, and it's that in quasi-intelligent behavior of the thing which is uh, what is called design in the classical conception. Okay, so that's, you know, in a nutshell, the classical way. Now, Jay properly pointed out that, um, well, one last very important point. So, if you were to state this point in the modern terminology, what you'd say is that it, final cause is simply a way of saying, an old-fashioned way of saying, following a law of nature. Things that follow laws of nature, which includes basically all natural things that are intelligible, are act, acting for an end or proceeding according to a final cause, according to the classical conception. What about the modern way? <clears throat> well, there's, uh, a, as, as, as Jay said, a long story here, and I won't uh, go into even, uh, I, won't, I won't, I'll be even more on the surface than he was in terms of the, the uh, um, the ex explication of this, of the modern turn and the banishment of final caus causality from a, as a kind of mode of explanation in, in science. But I think what we can say um, for sure is that um, 
that what we ended up with at the end of a several hundred year period where first there was this uh, move towards the mechanistic conception of nature, mathematical laws governing or reigning somehow over a uh, sort of flat mechanical universe. Now with God in the picture initially, God is the sort of top level, then the laws of nature understood mathematically, and then matter as this kind of uh, passive uh, stuff in which God reigns through the, the use of, through the means of the laws. That was kind of the new mechanical worldview that came in in the early modern period. Um, and there's a famous quote from this period, which was in, in context perhaps appropriate, but came to sort of as an aphorism sort of summarize this. And this was when uh, Laplace was asked, supposedly by Napoleon, I believe, you know, what about God? I mean, you've got, you've got this whole theory of the solar system, um, and accord, according to Newton's theory, there was a need for some tweaking of the, of the, of the planetary motion, so that there was a necessity for God in that sense. And Laplace said, I have no need of that hypothesis. In other words, I have a mathematically complete model that accounts for all the evidence, and I don't need to, you know, come up with some notion of God intervening. Which was, again, in a, in a modest sense, a perfectly reasonable scientific statement. But what it came to represent was a much broader understanding of a what once had been a tripartite understanding, God, law, and uh, mechanical, flat, passive nature, now we simply have laws and, and, and matter. That's it. We've gotten rid of this uh, highest level hypothesis. Um, <clears throat> so that, in a nutshell, again, very small nutshell, is, is the modern turn. And, and with that, you have this strange environment arising in which you study the nature in, with all of its incredibly order, orderly pattern ways, full of you know, replete with uh, structure and mathematically intelligible aspects, um, and yet at the same time, a belief that somehow this can all just happen without any reference to a creator. Um, now there's a lot of things going on in this period that, that, can, that can, could lead to that. I mean, at the same time we have the Reformation going on, there's, there's things going on in intellectual history which, um, you know, if you look at the whole picture, and again, this, you know, we could spend hours and hours on this topic, um, you can begin to understand why there was a kind of retreat from natural, natural theology or into a kind of fideism. That is, pe people who were believers still believed that God was the, the, the author and the cause of all these things. But they felt that they, they came to see that as a matter of faith and that reason alone, acting of its own, without uh, reference to revelation, couldn't achieve these, the knowledge of these higher things. <clears throat> so with that as kind of the background, I want to turn to, very briefly, to three modern examples of a kind of resurrection of, of, of an argument, either, either to God, either to creation, or at least to design. Um, one, one very quick qualification here, because, you know, in the end, I'll, I'll end up disagreeing with my friend Jay on a couple of things, but I think it's really important to point out that there's a world of difference between people who believe that you can know the existence of some intelligence through uh, studying design or studying nature and seeing the patterns there and seeing design versus those who believe that it's impossible to arrive at those things from, from the perspective of, of unaided human reason. So in some sense, you know, there's a, I'm on Jay's side, I'm on the side of the intelligent design movement when it comes to the view that through reason we can know the, that, that there is design in nature. Um, and I would of course go beyond that to say that you can know not just that there is design, but you can know who the designer is in the sense that you can know it's the god of the philosophers. So let's, let's just very briefly do these three case studies. I'm going to uh, use it as example three things. First of all, Big Bang Theory. Secondly, this cosmic fine-tuning. And thirdly, the intelligent design arguments in, that we find in biology. And to try to illustrate my points, I'm going to use a, a, a sort of schematic here. I'm going to start with a, a schematic of the kind of steady state universe. Um, Dr. Barr has written eloquently in his book about, you know, what, what did science look like in the 19, at the turn of the 20th century? Uh, the steady state universe, the model was regnant. We seem to have, you know, either have or soon to have a complete account for almost every kind of natural phenomenon. And uh, as he pointed out, at least psychologically, whether this is philosophically sound or not, the, the, the felt experience of people in this time was that, that God was on the retreat. There was no reason to have a notion of God in this, you know, scientifically tractable, uh, completely um, orderly cosmos that had always existed and had a se seeming therefore kind of necessity and therefore, you know, was, was complete unto itself, and scientific explanations, therefore, were, were completely adequate. So this is kind of a schematic of that, of that steady, steady state universe. Now, the first thing that happened um, in, in this story, um, although there's going to be some overlap in, in these, these three parts we'll talk about, was the uh, introduction of the Big Bang Theory. So in the Big Bang Theory now, we get 
uh, well, um, so yes, laws above, laws above the cosmos kind of raining down. Again, this, this is, and one of the interesting things here is exactly how do these things control or, or cause or operate on matter. Um, and that's kind of left as an, as an unexplained phenomenon. Um, there, you know, there's, in some way, there's something that's allowing the laws to somehow cause the things below, but that, how that happens isn't, isn't really ever explained. And again, as, uh, there's a great article by Nancy Cartwright, who's a philosopher of science, called No God, No Laws, where she challenges her atheist colleagues and says, look, if you, you know, th this whole structure of, of the cosmos came from a time in which there was a three-part structure, God, law, nature. But you've gotten rid of the top layer, yet you still believe that the middle thing causes the lower things. But how is that possible? And she uh, you know, argues, I think, very, very well that you cannot have this, this understanding of causality unless you resurrect the notion of God. So let's get rid of the, you know, how did you like my big bang there? So I've got a little uh, <laughs> cheesy little animation there to, to show that, okay, so we've gotten rid of a steady state universe. We've introduced the notion based on the discoveries that Jay mentioned that if you, you know, roll back the, the, the tape of, of a cosmic clock uh, from an expanding universe, you get to evidence of, a, of a, an initial condition, a, a, a singularity at the beginning. Um, and again, the, even the word beginning is problematic because there was no time before this. Um, but nevertheless, you have this notion of the singularity. So along, along comes this idea, and it did have, you know, clearly had some theistic implications. Many people, you know, it didn't, it didn't help matters from the atheist perspective that it was, you know, the idea came from a Catholic priest, uh, George Lemaitre, who was a, a Belgian physicist. Um, so that was, a, that was an issue. And so there was quite a number of years, many decades, where Big Bang Theory, while you know, increasingly prevalent and accepted as a, as a sort of a standard model, re encountered resistance on the ground that it was kind of, a, by implication, sort of creationist, and people didn't like it for that reason. But here's what I think is a really interesting point, is that as the decades went by, atheists kind of got used to it, and they kind of stopped worrying about it. So um, now I want to ask, why is that? Why is it that in this model, we're going to stop here for a second, I can be a perfectly satisfied atheist. Now, I may say some crazy things. We heard some crazy quotes from some of the, the physicists yesterday and today about you know, things just popping out of nothing, what have you. But still, the point is that a, you can be a sort of metaphysically satisfied atheist with this model. And I think I, I'm going to try to, I'm going to postulate an answer. For the very same reason that I can get used to the idea that these laws are just there because they have a kind of implicit simplicity. There's the idea that there's, probably some grand unified theory that is just there, it's kind of beautiful and simple, and from that derive other subsidiary laws. It's just there, I don't have to explain something that's very, very simple like that. And I think for the very same reason, if you look at the, the temporal perspective and think about Big Bang, the, the non-theist can also eventually become comfortable with this because of its kind of simplicity. That is, the idea that if something's very simple and just sort of is, you don't need to explain it, you can just assume it. So again, I can't prove that, but I, I believe that that's why psychologically and, and, and you know, kind of intellectually, this picture, in the end, is not problematic for the atheist or the agnostic. They, they're, they're comfortable with this. Now, whether they should be is a different question. I would go back to what I said at the beginning, which is, I'd like to hear where these laws come from, for example, or why there's something rather than nothing. But the point is, this is a, a, a situation where people became fairly comfortable. But I want to introduce now this thing that Jay mentioned, and I think it's a very important point, which is um, the question of cosmic fine-tuning. So as the model developed and as people began to think, what would it mean to have a set of initial conditions that gave, gave rise to the Big Bang? <clears throat> what they found was, <clears throat> well, first of all, the, you know, the laws are now kind of more filled in. We have the possibility of a grand unified theory. Uh, we have string theory, arguably, as, as maybe the, the way of making quantum theory and relativity somehow be conjoined or, or derivable from a common set of simple principles. Um, but, but along come the, um, uh, you know, this evolutionary cosmos. So you have this very strong notion of how uh, the cosmos itself is evolving from you know, the Big Bang all the way through uh, time to where we are today. And, and essentially the, the key, some of the key points are, you know, first of all, the sort of coalescing of what you might call normal matter. We get first generation stars. We need more generations of stars to create heavy elements. Heavy elements um, are then possible to create Earth-like planets. Then it, when you have an Earth-like planet, then you can have life begin um, it, spontaneously according to the standard account. Um, and then you can have evolutionary history and you can have these sort of interesting events that are uh, challenging for standard evolutionary theory like the Cambrian explosion. 
and eventually you have human beings as kind of the, the end of this process. Not the in, intended end according to the standard account, but you know, temporally at, at the end. <clears throat> so that's, again, that's kind of this, the model that, that we have and that both atheists are comfortable with and that theists you know, accept and have a different interpretation of. But one of the, the next challenge, so after Big Bang, which I think that has been sort of accounted for in terms of it's been accommodated into uh, an atheist uh, worldview and it's of course accepted by theists as well, the next thing that came along, uh, overlapping somewhat, was this idea of uh, a cosmic fine-tuning. So in the cosmic fine-tuning uh, argument, what you see is you have a whole set of seemingly arbitrary laws and constants which make up the, um, <clears throat> the initial conditions. And the key thing I want to emphasize here is that they seem arbitrary. There's a very large number of them. They involve a bunch of numbers and, and, and relations between numbers that are, that are not derivable. They have no, there's nothing simple about them. You can't derive them from some, uh, from some meta theory. And this became very troubling and very problematic for the, the uh, sort of anti-theist position, the atheist position, because it does seem like a, a very unlikely coincidence that these things could all happen together. However, there's, this is the key point. Um, the reason I believe that this view, as opposed to uh, ID and biology, which I'll get to in a second, is, so, um, is much more acceptable for many theists to make as a design argument is that once the universe gets going, then the causality of this, this lower bar, this naturally evolving cosmos, there's no, there's no intervention there, there's no agency, there's nothing. So the agency or the design, if you will, is all front-loaded into the evolving cosmos. And that, I think, it makes many scientists much more comfortable with the design argument uh, than the alternative. The alternative in biology is essentially to posit these kind of uh, activities of an intelligent agent. So I'm going I'm to describe these or show these as like little breaks in natural causality. So, for example, life begins on Earth. Now, as was said yesterday, there's very, the naturalistic accounts of this phenomenon are very, very weak. So many people believe that this is a, an example of something where science may never actually discover any naturalistic account. And so that is a kind of break in this cosmic web of, of causality. Um, but beyond that, again, they become more controversial. So things like evolutionary, you know, large-scale increases in, of, in information in the Cambrian explosion, as it's often expressed, um, that becomes sort of problematic for people because, again, it's viewed as a sort of uh, break in this, in this cosmic chain of, of causality. And even many theists are uncomfortable with the idea that God is somehow, or some uh, cosmic agent is somehow doing something in, in, this, in this story. So that, go, that, that goes on, these kind of interventions. I, I'll, I'll close with, with essentially a couple of thoughts. Um, <clears throat> first of all, um, if I were to tell this story from a philosophical point of view, I would, I would change this, this picture uh, pretty, uh, pretty consistently. What I would do is I would say, first of all, that, that um, the evolutionary story is a, is a story not just across time, but also across form. That is, there's a rising, a kind of ascent of form over time. Um, which is not the same as simply laws reigning from above. I would agree with, uh, with um, Professor Sitch from yesterday where he pointed out that the mathematical descriptions we have of nature are models of nature, but not themselves the sort of fundamentally real, real things about nature. Um, and so you end up with a, a kind of different view. And, and again, if you get, I think if you get the philosophy of nature right, which is essentially, essentially what we're talking about, you can get rid of things like, um, you know, whether there's uh, breaks in this causality, or not is not really that important. I mean, it's interesting. It's an empirically interesting question, but it doesn't matter in terms of the ultimate, uh, you know, uh, rightness of your understanding of the natural world. Um, <clears throat> you can even get rid of things like like Big Bang. If that goes away, it turns out that, you know we go back to a steady state model. That's not really a problem if you again if you can get your your um, understanding of nature to be properly aligned with a with a kind of good philosophical background. So. Um, and so in closing, I'm going to go through the, um, you know, the, the, the key points here is, first of all, the, this Thomistic perspective or the natural philosophy perspective is sort of maximal design. Finality and intelligibility everywhere. So it's sort of design everywhere, if you will. And the second thing is that you can't really prove this design from within the scientific framework precisely because uh, the science is predicated on the intelligibility and the order of nature. And so for science to even get off the ground, you have to have an orderly cosmos. So thank you very much.